in Western countries, no one likes to grow old. Mm -hmm. And when asking anybody's birthday after 39, it's always 30. <laughs> <laughs> they don't like to tell 40, 50. And then soon you're, you're not supposed to ask. You're not supposed to ask any lady or gentleman how old they are. Because in old age, then we cannot enjoy so rigorously. We cannot play sports so well. Even we don't listen to music so well anymore. We don't hear, we don't see. We cannot enjoy. Well, in material life, enjoyment is the whole purpose of life. So when you are growing old, you are losing the grip. You see, you are losing the grip on life, and it becomes embarrassing. And especially in the materialistic culture, older people, they are embarrassed. But in spiritual culture, in Krishna consciousness, it's just the opposite. We don't give a lot of value to youth. Youth is there. Hmm? There is a saying, God has wasted youth on young people. <laughs> he has wasted youth on young people. Because mainly they run here and there and they don't do anything useful with their energy. And by the time we begin to understand the real value of life, then our energy is less and so many aches and pains come. So they say, God has wasted the youth on the young people. He has wasted the money on the rich people. Because so many rich people, they don't know the use of money. They keep money in huge stock uh, and spend it very miserly way. It is rare to find a rich person who knows what to do with money. Very rare. So, in spiritual life, we see age as an asset. Age is an asset. It is not uh, losing the grip. Uh, rather, it is strengthening the grip on our higher consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so, with aging in a Vaishnav community, this is a good thing. Uh, we like to see the Vaishnav community getting members in its ranks with some age. Look around. Who, who is here in this ashram? There are not very many aged people. Hmm? With aged people, there is wisdom. Hmm? There is so much experience. Krishna tells Arjuna in Bhagavad Gita that the wealth of society is age. The elder people, they are the wealth of society because they have the wisdom, they have the experience. But in modern society, there is a creation called euthanasia. And that means after a certain age, they will put you to sleep like an animal. Hmm? Because you serve no uh, uh, visible purpose in the society. And for a materialist, it is true. Old people who are materialists don't have any wisdom. They don't have any higher consciousness. And therefore, they have nothing to share with the society, hmm? which is only uh, trying to express itself and uh, in so much material enjoyment. Do you follow me, what I'm saying? But in spiritual life, it is quite a different thing. So, similarly, with the birthday, the materialists ce celebrate the birthday that all we have enjoyed, we have got child. And child will give us much enjoyment. We should be happy. And that boy or that girl, they also are going to enjoy, we'll be happy for them. So, two-part happiness. Huh? That child is giving happiness to the parents, and the child is also going to enjoy, so they also celebrate. Mm -hmm. But Vaishnava celebration of birth is something different. Mm -hmm. We celebrate birth because in human life, one is given the opportunity to become God conscious. It is not available in other forms of life. There are many forms of life, mm -hmm. many. Mm -hmm. When we established this ashram originally, on the signboard it said, Human Sanctuary. <laughs> because we felt, where can the humans run and hide? Huh? We are giving tiger sanctuary, elephant sanctuary, bird sanctuary. But where do we humans, where can we run? Where can we take shelter? Where can we find some sanctuary, some sanctified existence? Huh? Cities are squeezing us day and night. Hmm? 
Day and night, the cities are squeezing us, demanding our work. Government is demanding tax. We live together for this purpose, but when we live together this, for this purpose, we increase disease. Categorically, if society was regulated properly, there would be less disease in the village than in the city. City means too much uh, unmanageable waste, too many uncontrolled animals, dogs, and things, and rats, and all disease-carrying things breed in cities. Of course, villages are also in a bad position these days. Huh? Why? Because lots of intelligent people, they ran out of the village, went to live in the city. We say intelligent, but is that intelligent? That's the question. Huh? But means educated people, as soon as they get education, leave the village. And they leave a struggling situation behind. But actually, the real thing is that if people lived in villages, there would be less disease, there would be, there would be uh, less suffering. So, we celebrate the birth of any human being in spiritual life because it is an opportunity that in that human form of life they will put an end to all the miseries of material consciousness. Huh? And they will approach the lotus feet of Krishna. They will approach the supreme goal of life. This is possible in human life, not in other forms of life. So, God gave us this human life for that purpose. That is first purpose. Second purpose, it is second class. Huh? If you want good eating, better you ask God, let me be pig. Uh, let me be elephant. I'm giving good eating. Huh? How many chapatis you can eat? How many idlis you can eat? How many much rice you can eat? If you eat more, it will make you sick. But if you are elephant, you can eat 80 kilos or one quintal daily. You may eat. Big satisfaction. All the senses, what you want to enjoy, you can only enjoy in a limited way in human life. Limited. Otherwise, you get sick. People tell, sex is enjoyment. Then we ask, then why there are so many diseases associated with sex, and those diseases may kill you also. So if sex was for enjoyment, God made a big mistake, because he just put so many diseases there at the same time. And while getting enjoyment... You may be a dead man. AIDS is there and other diseases also. Millions, millions, millions of people in the world. United States, Europe, Asia, Africa, millions. We, we lost the count. They're all dying today. Millions of people because of the AIDS. And where it came from? They enjoy. They enjoy the sex. You may also eat too much rice and that will be a problem for you. You see? If you eat too much rice, eat, 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 you get diabetic, blood sugar. Mm -hmm. Overeating causes blood sugar. So however way you look at it, this human form of life has got minimum, minimum capacity for enjoyment. There should be a signal. It is not meant for enjoyment. It is meant for something which is unlimited. And that is the development of our consciousness, God consciousness. We never heard yet that that became a problem. Anyone who actually experienced what is God, hmm? then he turned to us and said, that is a problem, you know. After getting too much God, I got stomach ache. I got headache. Huh? I got disease from that. And then we never heard that. We never saw that. No one ever told us that. Maybe any false Bhagavan and so many things, they got disease. They thought they were God. Then they got disease and had to go to hospital. Huh? False gods. Hmm? Now, I'm not saying if you pray to God, if you chant Hare Krishna, you won't get sick. That is the nature of this body. I'm also painting today one swollen leg, some problem. That is the nature of bomb, you see. But Atma, mm -hmm. Atma, it will go on experiencing more pleasure in the existence of Krishna. Divine pleasure, that is called Ananda. Mm -hmm. Not this material enjoyment, spiritual enjoyment, Ananda. And that has got no limit as far as we are concerned. There is more ananda than we are able to experience. Such a stock of ananda is available that we cannot experience it all. It is so much huh, that every living being can take a share in it beyond what he can consume. Hmm? You, I mean, beyond, beyond your consumption means you become tired of that. Enough I ate chocolate. Enough I ate ice cream. Bah! Finished. Not Ananda. 
You may go on experiencing ananda, spiritual pleasure, then you never become satiated. And there is plenty for everyone. Hmm? That is the nature of Krishna. He is the reservoir of all pleasure. All pleasure is derived from Krishna, actually. Even the pleasure that we experience in this world, it is Krishna, but covered by a layer of maya. A layer, just a covering. Hmm? Like indirect light. Hmm? For days the cloud is there, light is there. Daytime comes, but no sun. Light is there. Then the clouds are removed, then we see the source of light. Do you follow? So all pleasure in this world is like light on a cloudy day. The cloud is maya, illusion. We have forgotten Krishna. We don't know anymore what is Krishna, what is God. We are living in an illusion in this world. We are thinking, I am master. And because I am master, I must act, uh, Assert myself to enjoy. I must collect money. I must collect power. Hmm? I must join a political party and take a seat. Then I must take money. Hmm? And this way I must build a fortune. Ah, then Yamaraj comes and knocks on our door one fine day. Finish. Ah, finished. Everything lost. We are living in an illusion. We are not master. We are servant. Hmm? That is not a bad thing. I am servant. Huh? Here, uh, in this world, when we are servant, that's a little down position, you see. But when you are servant of God, then you are the value of millions of prime ministers. Hmm? Millions of prime ministers. Actually, prime minister, he is also servant of Bhagavan. Hmm? That, that old idea is called Raja Ram. Raja Ram, Raja Rishi. Hmm? He is the Raja, prime minister, he is the king. Doesn't mean he is God, it means he is the servant of God. He's God's Raja, God's man on earth. He will be given respect as representative of God. All are servant of God. Uh, there's a time of year when everyone prays to Lakshmi. There's a time of year when everyone prays to Saraswati. When everyone prays to Ganesh uh, and different village gods. All of them are servant of Bhagavan, Narayana, Vishnu and Krishna. All. They're all servants. Hmm? Ekla Ishwar Krishna. One Bhagavan is Krishna, Sri Krishna. Sri Krishna is also known as Narayana. Sri Krishna is also known as Vishnu. Sri Krishna is also known as Govinda. There are many names of Bhagavan. Hmm? But Ganesh, Shiva, Saraswati, Lakshmi, so many Devas, Devis, they are not Bhagavan complete. They themselves are servant of Bhagavan. If you offer any food to a deva, first he offers that to Bhagavan. Then it goes like that. He doesn't directly eat that, actually. All serve, what do you do? You are a servant of God. And we offer you something. Huh? Either physically or mentally, you offer that to your Lord. If you are a Brahmin, and you are collecting some bhikshu, house to house, some alms, and someone gives you something very fine to eat, a real Brahmin doesn't think, oh, very tasty, and fill his belly with that. Huh? A real Brahmin, he accepts that on behalf of his Lord, of his Bhagavan, he accepts. He is only a messenger. He accepts on the behalf of his Lord. Hmm? Then, what it means, he only takes prasadam. Hmm? He only takes Krishna prasadam. Hmm? In Karnataka, long time ago, <coughs> Maybe 200 years back, 300 years, four, let me see. 400 years back, sure, there was one system, four and 500 years ago. And at every temple in Karnataka, in any temple, whether it was a, a deva, a village temple, a, a, a shakti, any temple, there was shaligram. Shaligram is the representation of Vishnu, Narayan. And in every temple, first... Narayan was worshipped in every temple. This was in the time of the Vijayanagar here in Karnataka. Vijayanagar, Krishna Deva Roy and all those people. First, Narayan was worshipped. Then the prasad of Narayan, that was offered in that temple to that Deva. Ganesh, Shiva, all. That was the standard. Because actually that is the eternal standard. If we look throughout the Vedic literature, there are not many gods. There's one supreme God, and then all else are his servant. You see? So, when we live in the ignorance of that, uh, 
that is the cause of suffering. We are thinking we are master. We are enjoying, then material nature, prakriti, charges us. Hey, crime, stolen property, you are not the enjoyer. Huh? Even your own wife and children, even your own husband and children, they are not your property. They are not your property. They are the property of Bhagavan. Hmm? You are simply looking after them, closed. Hmm? You are looking after them for some short period of time in this lifetime. Hmm? Many lifetimes they have had. Many lifetimes you have had. Many lifetimes they will have had. Hmm? Sometimes I ask these children, how old you are? 15, 14. Where you were 15 years ago? No answer. You are 14 where you were 16 years ago. I don't know. Yes, you were there. Maybe you were one old man in the village that time. Somewhere you were. Life after life we are coming here in this world. Not to become expert at material enjoyment. Life after life. Oh, this life I couldn't own my own factory. Let me come again, work more harder and get the factory. Huh? Not like that then we'll never be free from this life. Huh? One year, we will be the owner of the factory. The next year, we will be the sweeper in the factory. There's a story, one man, he got money by hook, crook, and any other means for his family. He, his idea was, family is first. By any means, I must get money. Hmm? They said he was from the, like this uh, Calcutta side, somewhere that side. Then, one fine day, his life was over, he was old, his children were there, four or five sons, huh? joint family, all were married, he was very happy. He died, he left this world. Then he had some karma. He used to abuse the cobbler, the man who fixed the shoes. Hmm? He used to regularly abuse that man. He'd send his shoes for fixing and then just give a slap when he came, what, this is too much, throw him less than half the price. Just abuse that poor man. So, by the, some, mix, some karma, karma you cannot explain so easily. Law, action and reaction. His next life, he became the cobbler's son. That cobbler, shoe-fitting man, he got a nice boy who was born, right? So, then he was raised as a boy and he's learning to fix shoes. And his sons are living in a joint family, five sons. Right? So then, one day, they are calling. Please come, we have some shoes. So that man goes to his previous house. This time his age is 14, huh? 15. He goes to his previous house. Do you understand? And they tell, you fix these shoes. He goes for fixing and he brings back. Then they tell, what you said, this is not correct. They just give a slap. His own sons are now giving a slap on his head. So who we are? Are we the cobbler's son? Are we the rich man? Are we the rich man's son? Who are we in this world? We are the servant of Krishna. We are the servant of Bhagavan. That is who we are. That is our occupational duty. And beyond that, we have, a, we have a reality. We have an identity there with Him in the spiritual world, in Vaikuntha, Paravyoma. We have a place. He has reserved a place. Our name tag is there. Our place is there. Simply we have to prepare ourselves to go there and live with that Supreme Father. And what is that? We have to embrace, I am servant, dasosmi, I am servant of him. We have to embrace that in everything we do. And we have to see him in everyone. He is in everyone. Hmm? First we learn to see him in the temple. He is here in the temple, in the Garbhagudi. But it's not that he's only here and nowhere else. He is in everyone. First, he is in the heart of his devotees. Then he's in the heart of all living beings. Huh? Some people say, I see God in nature. They don't like to come to temple. They say there is no God in temple. If God is in nature, why is not also in the temple? This is a defect. God is everywhere. People say, I see God in the mountain. Then they will say, why are you worshipping Shaligram? I say, if you are seeing God in the mountain, the big stone, what's the problem to see God in the small stone? He's the biggest of the big and the smallest of the small, you see. So this is not a truthful search for God. Such persons are trying to limit. Hmm? Limitation due to lack of surrender. We must surrender to God. We must embrace the idea of being His servant. We must embrace that. That means surrender. Hmm? 
then we'll be happy to know He is everywhere and He is always with us. Then we are approaching who we are, what we are to do with our life, we are approaching the perfection of life. So what is happening, one who lives life in this way, lives what we call the life of love. Life in the ashram is meant to be a life of love. And Krishna is the supreme object of that love. And as sannyasis, as brahmacharis, as grihastas, as vanaprastas, as children, as adults, in any stage of life, we are simply loving Him. That is life in the ashram. Ashram means a place where there is no work. No work. But anytime you come here, you'll find out that we are always very busy. Sometimes we have no time. No time to read newspaper. No time to watch television. No time. No time. What you're doing? We're very busy. But you said it is a place of no work. That work means karma. No karma here. We're not doing man's work. We're not doing my work or your work. We're doing his work. That is called seva. So no work here. But some people took it to mean, in ashram we will be lazy fellows. We'll just get money from the people. We'll buy rice and have some bar and eat more rice. <laughs> and don't do anything. Laying, laying on the side. Only giving rest to the left side. That is not an ashram. That is a lazy man's ashram. Real ashram, very busy, always serving. In every little house, behind the door, there is some service going on. Outside in front of the door, there is service, always service, garden service, kitchen service, book publishing service, internet uh, preaching service, all variety of service. Even we are in the film service also, producing videos. Everything service, always very, very busy. Why? Because we love Krishna. We love Krishna, we love Krishna's devotees. Without love, we are mayavadis. You know what is a mayavadi? A mayavadi means an impersonalist. He doesn't care for anyone other than himself. Huh? Only he cares for himself. So, <clears throat> the goal of life is that. Prema Pumarto Mahan. The goal of life is to develop, awaken our love for Krishna. Divine love. Live the life of love. So, <clears throat> that is why we celebrate any person's birth. Then, we celebrate also our Guru's birth. That is called Vyasa Puja Day. It is little different than ordinary birthday of any other devotee or human being. Because <clears throat> this knowledge comes to us in the Veda, Vedas. And the Vedas come to us in this age by the uh, grace of Vyas, Vyasadeva. Mm -hmm. Nearly 5,000 years ago, Vyasadeva wrote all the Vedas, and he culminated in his work, Srimad Bhagavatam. First he wrote so many uh, Veda, and then concluded with the Vedanta Sutra. Then after Vedanta Sutra, he wrote Srimad Bhagavatam. That is considered the Samadhi of Vyas. The culmination of, of knowledge is Vedanta. The end of knowledge, Vedanta. Then he took something more. What is the purport of the end of knowledge? That is Bhagavatam. So <clears throat> it is Vyas who wrote all these things. And it is our Guru who teaches us all these things as Vyasa's representative. So we don't see our Guru as an ordinary person. We see our Guru as representing Krishna, representative of Krishna. And therefore we remember his birth, birthday in relation to Vyas, who gave us all the Vedic knowledge, who gave us Vedanta Sutra, who gave us Srimad Bhagavatam. <clears throat> so, on that day, uh, we are celebrating his, not just birth in this world, uh, but his uh, having come to uh, uh, deliver uh, the message of Krishna consciousness. When you go to look for gold, you have to dig in the earth. Hmm? When you go to look for the truth, 
you have to look beyond the ordinary. You cannot see the truth. Although the truth is everywhere, still you have to look very hard. Realizing the truth, the truth is everywhere, you see. We begin our uh, search for truth, first search for Sri Guru. That is the search for truth. Hmm? We have to find someone whom we feel is such a representative of Krishna that all truth will come through that person. Um, it is not that you will just meet that person and automatically you will know that. I saw many people meet Prabhupada, meet my guru. Many people met him, didn't understand anything, didn't see anything. Simply thought it was very nice and they went home. Uh, but we are looking and we are seeing only the truth. He is a living truth, you see. Another man is looking and uh, seeing only one old Swami from Allahabad or whatever, like that. Why he came to America. Maybe he wants to set up a business. Uh, many Swamis setting up business. Uh, sometimes we think long hair, gray beard, shaved head, big sika, some colored cloth, ah, Guruji. No. That is external. We cannot find <coughs> Guru by looking externally. We have to look with some depth of vision, but it starts from the seer, from our self. If we are a shallow looking person, then we cannot see very deeply. We must first come back deep within our self, and then we must start the search from deep within our self with our deep sincerity, we must search to see uh, what is Guru. Then we, then we will find Guru. But if we simply go looking, <coughs> visiting so many ashrams, looking this one, what type of car he has, what type of jewelry he has, how many? What, always in Mysore, I'll meet somebody every once in a while in a shop. Oh, you're from that ashram, Shiranga Patna, yes? How many people are there? How many are there? I told him, by the grace of God, only half a dozen or so. <laughs> Any more than that, we'll lose the peace. Huh? Yes, only half a dozen. Well, maybe two dozen in rush. <laughs> because people are charmed by the numbers. Oh, 500, oh, 4,000, oh, 5,000. Does that assure you anything? What if 5,000 people have gone to a cheater? You see? What if 5,000 people are buying bad stock? in the market. Will you purchase the bad stock because many are buying? If, you're, if you are a bad investor, you may, you see. But you uh, will search to buy something very genuine. So search is necessary. Genuine search for truth is necessary. Then one may discover the truth, you see. So there is a saying, there was a man, he had a big shop. He had many things in the shop. Then one servant came there and he started going back in the back go down and bringing out these very nice things what this man has in his stock you see very old antique pieces nice nice pieces so then the owner he was very happy oh i didn't even myself i forgot i had this thing lying there you are such a good servant you went there and you brought out what i it is mine you brought it out you follow so in this way a disciple should approach his guru in that way. He should look very deep. The guru himself doesn't see what the disciple sees. He doesn't see that. I'm only seeing my guru. I'm only thinking of my guru. I am his servant. I am only seeing what is his wealth, what is his greatness, what is within him. I'm not looking what is within me, what, how great I am or any of those things. Never. A disciple only sees himself as a disciple. Hmm? That is one of the qualifications of Guru. He must see like that. Huh? That's why we ask about Guru Prampara. Sometimes today in India, modern India, big, big Guru is there. Who is his Guru? He doesn't even have one. So how could he always be thinking, I am servant of my Guru? You see, He himself has no Guru. He was in the postal service. <laughs> <laughs> or he was in the prison. You see, or he was in the circus and he learned magic. <laughs> like this. 
But sometimes, because pressing is there, they will tell, oh yeah, I, uh, my guru is that one. They'll name something, you see. <coughs> guru Parampara. It is not that just one guru replacing another. It's a way of thinking, you see. And everyone is thinking, I am simply the servant of my guru. So a disciple comes and he will reveal many things about the guru which the guru himself does not reveal or cannot say, you see. So that was very nice if you listened close. He told one or two very nice, very nice things. Very nice. A good student, a good disciple. A good credit. Hare Krishna. Huh? What is it? All, all that we have expressed here, we only received from yourself. Hare Krishna. Go ready. It is not our own. <laughs> then whose is it? It is also not mine. <laughs> And it goes to Krishna. And if you meet Prabhupada, he'll tell you, and he will say what he did, he'll say, only I was serving my guru, what I did was his grace. Then you will find his guru, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. Oh, what you did was so wonderful. It was all the grace of Bhakti Vinod. He will say it was the grace of my gurus, Gorkashore and Bhakti Vinod. Like this we will make our way to Krishna. Everyone, the divine grace is coming from the Supreme Lord and it is coming through the disciplic succession. Divine knowledge, divine grace, it is coming through them. The search for Sri Krishna through Guru and Parampara. Um, there are 26, 26, 25, 26 qualities of a devotee. They are mentioned in the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, that is our English book, Nectar of Devotion. Maybe in Chaitanya Charitamrita also there. Um, <clears throat> and uh, these are the uh, qualities which we should find developing in a uh, devotee and particularly we should find them in pure devotee now uh, actually we are only interested in one type of devotee and that is pure devotee mm -hmm. uh, what type of food do you like? pure food do you, do you like any rice with dirt inside? no do you like any sweet rice with some uh, leaf, just anything inside? No? You want rice pure, want food pure? What type of water do you want? Little mixed water with some dirty thing inside? No. Pure only, right? Mm. And devotion should be no different. We should want only pure devotion. We should want to see what is pure devotion. We should want to learn what is pure devotion. We should want to become pure devotees of Krishna, ourself. Hmm? We should not be satisfied to eat filthy things, drink filthy water. We should not be satisfied to do, be doing devotion, which is just all kind of mixed up and all over the place, you see. Devotion to satisfy Krishna, as we heard a few minutes ago, must be pure. Hmm? The offering must be pure. If you want to offer nivedyam to Krishna, boga, it must be pure. It must be cooked by a pure person. It must be cooked in a pure situation, clean situation. It must be offered. If any dog enters the kitchen in the time of cooking or anything like that, it is spoiled because that dog is merely thinking to eat that. It's spoiled. It must be pure. So if even the rice must be pure, then why not the devotee? He must be pure also. If, if Bhagavan, if Krishna is going to eat the rice, it must be pure then also the man who's going to go there, he also must be pure. He must have pure habit. He should not smoke beedi. He should not be chewing pan. He should not be drinking, doing all such things. Huh? He should also be pure in his habit. Huh? What is purity? We should try to know. What is pure devotion? We should try to learn. And we should become pure devotees of Krishna. It is not the impossible, it is the simple goal. Why you go to school? To become learned. Not to go after so many years and pronounce, I am fool. You learn to say, I am fool. Hmm? No, we go there to learn something, to learn a trade, to learn proper behavior. Huh? So when we come to an ashram, the goal is how to be a pure devotee. Purity is most interfered with by selfishness. Selfishness is the thing which interferes most with, with purity. Not drinking not smoking, not even these things. These are bad habits. They are called bad habits. Huh? But even sometimes one can give up those things 
and never, actually, not give them up, never touch those things for the whole life, according to one's birth sometimes. But no, nobody touches that thing. But there, this big ahankar is inside, big ego. This big ego, this spoils everything. Big pride, false pride. False pride is a very impure thing. So, wait, uh, uh, there's a point. Impurity. Huh? Twenty-six qualities. The twenty-six qualities of the pure devotees. I'm, I'm getting. I'll come back to that. But oh, selfishness. You see, how to practice selflessness? Hmm? By nature, in this world, everybody is very, very selfish. You see, we see everything according to our angle of vision as it suits us best. It is like the train. Huh? When the train pulls up, everybody rushes for the door. For what? To get their seat. You see? To do what? Leave one fellow standing. Or ten fellows standing, you see? Everybody rush, rushes. Then, we begin to see. Then enters an older lady or an older man, and they'll be standing. Then we see, right there, we're beginning some selflessness, if anyone will stand and offer a seat. Now, previously, in culture, a gentleman would always offer a seat to a lady, particularly in Western countries. But now they will leave them standing, simply hanging on the rope, riding the train. And the gent will simply sit and reading newspaper and the lady is standing. Previously he would throw his coat in the mud so that the lady will cross. Now he will drive by and <laughs> splash water from his car on the lady. It's, uh, so people are very, very selfish. So much selfish they don't even consider others. They drive in a five lakh ruby car on a rainy day and simply splash water and mud on the people. People have to run. They see what they're doing. So why I mention this today? Because it's an example. They are so selfish. They are so selfish. They don't even care to splash mud on other people. Very selfish. Huh? If we are selfish, we can satisfy only ourselves for some short time and then that self-satisfying thing that will become itself a great enemy within us and that will cause us great suffering and disease. Disease also. Hmm? Greediness causes disease. Huh? What? You're so selfish you're afraid everybody. Everybody's after you. Everybody wants to take from you. All anxiety inside and cause of disease. And your life is reduced. You see. So from the, lo the, the lowest end just living a normal life Selfishness, greediness, this is self-consuming, this is destructive. And on the higher side, we cannot approach God if we are filled with this selfishness. So, a life of devotion means to practice selflessness. How to give. Once we printed our ashram card, it said, give to live. Small message was there, give to live. Practice giving. What a nice feeling when we give a gift to somebody. Huh? Yesterday, one boy's birthday, he got ice cream for his birthday. So first he wants to come and give something to the swamis. He wants to give. It is his gift, but he wants to share that with others. Because in giving, in sharing, there is also a, a wonderful feeling. And when we're adults, you know there is more pleasure in giving a gift than in receiving a gift. Hmm? Hmm. Everyone is giving to the center. Everyone is giving to God. No one has anything to fear. This land is a treacherous land. Everyone is out to steal from you. Guard your pocket. Hmm? In a small group, we don't have to worry about a pickpocket. Bring several thousand people here, and we'll go missing a wallet. Huh? Even on Janmashtami, big crowd comes, we have to make sure we lock rooms, put guards. Because if a crowd of people comes to pray to God, that cheating man will move in that crowd. Hmm? Surely somebody lost the shoe this week, this time, Janmashtami. Before two Janmashtamis, 40 pairs of shoes went missing. One group of foreigners came. They're all wearing like the $50, means 2,000 rupee shoe. 40 pairs of shoes went missing. <laughs> New stock in Gunjam. <laughs> so even in a church, even in religion, people will enter with this cheating business. That is the nature of this world. So management of an ashram means try to keep out cheating elements, you see. We're not interested in mass numbers because in mass numbers comes the cheating element. We would like 
to have big numbers of people and all no cheaters, you see. But who's big number one cheater? I am big number one cheater. You, everyone should say, I am number one cheater. Not, not you, of yourself. Big number one cheater. It starts there. Honesty starts at home. Honesty starts with yourself. Selflessness starts with yourself. Honesty and selflessness. So when we become purified, we develop certain qualities. And poetic, poetry, it is one of the 26 qualities of a devotee. He likes to express things in a poetic way. So I, I'm very happy to see Maharaj is showing some poetic tendency in expressing his appreciation for Sri Guru and his grace. Very nice. Hare Krishna. Guru, Krishna Das and Guru Das. Actually, we are more concerned with Guru Das. We are in what's called Prakrita Lila. And Krishna is there in Aprakrita Lila. Prakrita Lila means this world. Hmm? And Krishna is in the Aprakrita Vaikuntha. He is there. So, his representative, we should serve him. Hmm? We should develop great faith in Guru. Uh, uh, guru, uh, uh, guru Shraddha. Guru Nishta. We should be very firm in our devotion uh, to Guru and this will, this, will, this will qualify us automatically for the higher world, you see. Um, everything will be revealed to us through submission, service, surrender uh, to Sri Guru. Hmm? That is the special feature within the Gaudiya school. Hmm? Within the Gaudiya school they give, we give more emphasis uh, to the position held by Guru than in any other uh, uh, philosophical school or any other Vaishnav school. Mm -hmm. Most importance uh, we give to Sri, Sri Guru, becoming Guru Das. Mm -hmm. So there was a man, and he told, when, then, uh, he told, oh, why have to surrender to Guru? Better you, you know, God is there. Then the other man next to him said, but God is so big, you can't get far enough away from him to see him. You see? He's so big, you can't get back enough to see him. And then the devotee said, yes, but he's so kind, he sent his representative, that's Sri Guru. So if we serve Guru, that service will go to Bhagavan. That will go to God. So actually, he was right. God is so great. What, what you'll do there? How you'll serve him? He's so far away, where he is. Even the sun cannot be reached in this lifetime if you boarded an airplane and began to fly. You see? If you fly at the speed of light, it will take you millions of years just to reach the sun. Bhagavan is way beyond the sun. How you'll go there? How you'll find him? The world is so big, where he is? You see? All these things are true, you see. But very, very quickly he comes, quicker than light. He can come and make himself known. But his grace, a guru is considered grace of Krishna. You see, Krishna is so kind, he sends someone to represent us. Just like any big officer in government. He can't come personally. He sends someone from his office. Huh? Oh, we feel honored. Someone from that higher office has come. You see, Then we'll place our appeal to them. He is a man in connection with the higher ministry. And our appeal will go there, you see. There is great hope in that, you see. Actually, if you know someone who is close to a minister, that may be better than knowing the minister directly, you see. If you know someone who is close to a minister, then you may move. You will get good success, you see. So, if we know someone who is close to Krishna, who is dear to Krishna, uh, and Krishna says, those who spread their life uh, sorry, those who spend their life spreading my message, they are dear to me. Huh? Who preaches Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, they are dear to me. So two things are there. We want to know someone and have someone's grace who is dear to Krishna. But then if you think about it, you want to become dear to Krishna yourself also. It is not that you want to stand on the outside and say, oh, in that house is a, a gentleman is very dear to Krishna. Think it yourself, what you want in life is you want to become dear to Krishna also. That is, an, that is natural. Hmm? 
We want to love and be loved. You see, that is the complete package. You see. So, we must approach Guru to learn how to serve Krishna, learn what is Krishna consciousness, and then we must practice that, and we must preach that, we must do that, and we will become dear to Krishna also. That is called Guru Parampara. It is not that there is only one gentleman, and he will be dear to Krishna, and all others not. If so, why spend our time here? What is the use of all of this? Huh? We also, every individual, we want to become dear to Krishna. But we never leave the shelter of our guru. That is always there. Not that, see, if you learn anything in a school, then you may even surpass your teacher in future. Any subject. Now, if you are a decent person, you'll always respect your teacher and show respect to your teacher, you see. But in guru-disciple, it is more than just show respect. It is more. You actually feel yourself only successful because of him. Even you may, in a certain way, you may excel your guru, you see. But actually, if you think, oh, now I have done more than my guru, then you become guru. <laughs> You've gone down the other side, you see, lost. Means a cow, you became like a cow. Huh? And then you are simply in his gosha. <laughs> my guru's guru, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, he never left India. His disciple, Prabhupada, he went around the world 12 times, established over 108 temples, did all these things, opened all these temples. He opened more temples than his guru. But he never thought, oh, I am more than my guru. My guru opened 64 temples. I opened 108 temples. I am more than him. Puna Musika Baba. If we think like that, again we become a mouse. Hmm? The story of the mouse. Uh, he wanted to become like tiger. And by the grace of one sage, Muni, Rishi in the forest, lastly the mouse became tiger. And after becoming tiger, he wanted to just eat that Rishi. Huh? That Rishi said, psh, psh. again he became the mouse. Huh? So, but if someone thinks, oh out of fear, Oh, I must always pray Guruji, I must always say these words, otherwise I'm again mouse. Then you're automatically mouse already. <laughs> it is not a cheating business. Like, oh, here comes the minister, show some respect. And when he passes, then you pass a bad remark. Huh? <laughs> not like that. That is politics. There is no politics with Guru. Guru-disciple relationship is one of affection. It is a, it is a, it is, its foundation is service. Huh? But it is service and love. Thank mm -hmm. you.